our scripture text is taken from the Gospel of Luke, from the first chapter. I'll begin reading at the 26th verse. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And the angel left her. Here ends our reading from our scriptures this day. May God's spirit be with us as we seek to understand and apply the truths of, the, of this message to our own spiritual lives. Amen.
have lived the Christmas story for so long that its familiarity can keep us from appreciating its depth, its spiritual truth. Scholars use a word to describe that truth. They call it incarnation. That uncommon word refers to God becoming human and taking on the life that you and I know each and every day. In his final letter, that of Philippians, the Apostle Paul announces and affirms this truth when he writes these words. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. What Paul recognizes here in Philippians, what he is convinced of, is that Jesus experienced the same life that you and I know. Jesus, Jesus experienced the heights and the depths of this life, with his glories and its failures, with its moments of faithfulness, along with temptations of the flesh. Jesus experienced it all. Now, there are a number of things we know about Jesus, and there are a number of things about which I can make some assumptions. Archaeologists, for instance, have been at work in the village of Nazareth, where Jesus lived and grew up. It was a tiny village, and most of the people made their homes in the caves. This suggests that the family of Jesus were poor folk. We know that his earthly father, Joseph, was alive at least through his 12th year, because along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, after the Passover celebration in Jerusalem, on their return trip to Nazareth, Joseph and Mary suddenly realize that Jesus is not with them. The Gospel writer Luke then describes their return to Jerusalem, where they search for their son, whom they find sitting among the elders in the temple, where he is conversing with them about the things of God. Following that story, Joseph is never mentioned again in the Gospels. So I assume he died sometime afterward. And I assume that not only did Jesus, the eldest child in the family, help his mother through his, her grief, but he also probably assumed responsibility for providing financially for the family and caring for his younger brothers and sisters. 
the Gospels suggest that he followed in his earthly father's profession, working at a manual day labor job. I assume he remained at home until his younger brothers were grown and were out on their own, and his sisters were married, and arrangements were made among his siblings who and how their mother Mary was to be cared for. It was then that Jesus was free to pursue his heavenly calling. By most accounts, he was probably about 30 years old at the time. Following his baptism, Jesus retreated into the desert and after fasting for 40 days was tempted by the devil. The evil one tempted him to take shortcuts, but Jesus resisted. After beginning his public ministry, he was dogged by his enemies. The Pharisees repeatedly argued with him. The local king, Herod Antipas, sent his troops out to apprehend him. Not only that, but he was also criticized at every turn. Even the chief of his disciples sought to discourage him from going to Jerusalem, where Jesus knew his mission would reach its pinnacle. Frequently, these 12 disciples, who had spent all their time in his presence, yeah, frequently they didn't understand his teachings and constantly had to ask him to please make things plain to them. Among his few successes were some reformed tax collectors and prostitutes, and a woman who had been demon-possessed, and a number of fishermen. Leaders in our day and age might call this a motley crew. When he finally did get to Jerusalem, his enemies seemed to get the better of him and manipulated others to get him eliminated, crucified. During that awful time, the Gospels report that one of his disciples betrayed him, another denied him, and the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke report that his disciples fled when he was led out to be crucified. When the Gospel writer John tells us of God taking the form of a human being, he is telling us that this includes all the difficulties, all the temptations, all the pitfalls that you and I experience. This teaching about the Word becoming flesh, about God becoming human, what the theologians call the incarnation, was not easy for the Son of Man. Indeed, as I just recounted, the life of Jesus was no walkthrough. So how is a person to respond to a truth like this? John Shea tells the story of a conversation he had with a five-year-old girl named Sharon. Certain of her facts about the birth of Jesus, Sharon recited them to John with slow solemnity, convinced that every word was a revelation. She said they were so poor they had only peanut butter and jelly sandwiches to eat, and they went a long way from home without getting lost. The lady rode a donkey, the man walked, and the baby was inside the woman. They had to stay in a stable with oxen and asses. Hmm? But three rich men found them because a star lighted the roof. Shepherds came, and you could pet the sheep, but not feed them. Then the baby was born. Do you know who he was? Sharon's quarter-sized eyes grew to the size of silver dollars. The baby was God. At that, Sharon jumped in the air, whirled around, dove into the sofa, and buried her head under a cushion, which John Shea says is the only proper response to the good news of the Incarnation. In the Bible, when God draws near to various men and women in a wide variety of ways, in all of them, I sense something of Sharon's response. Moses was curious, but intimidated. Isaiah was shocked and felt unworthy. Jonah fled. Mary was full of wonder. Saul of Tarsus was left speechless. Yeah, Sharon's response is quite in keeping 
with the response of these others. But the Christmas story isn't just about Jesus, for it also includes you and me. Yes, the incarnation, that belief that the word became flesh, also means that the presence of Jesus can be seen and felt in others. Along that line, let me share with you the story Deb Meckler tells. She was finishing her cutout cookies and getting them into the freezer, just in time to throw on some decent clothes and drive herself to church. She arrived moments before the start of the Sunday school Christmas program. She slipped into the back pew. Deb didn't know it, but she, along with the rest of the congregation, was about to have her encounter with the incarnate Jesus. The program began with the youngest Sunday school cherubs climbing onto the steps of the chancel to sing Away in a Manger and then recite lines that they had, mem had memorized. A microphone was handed from one child to the next as they rhymed their way through their much-practiced phrases. Since there was a large number of children participating, the Sunday school teachers decided the children could present a Christmas alphabet for their eager parents and grandparents to hear. One teacher stood at the front of the display pile with a pile of construction paper, each piece with a large glittery letter on each page. A is for angel, B is for Bethlehem, and so on. At times hesitant, with prompting from the front row, the children continued to make their way through their Christmas ABCs. That is, until after the child who had J, who proudly said, J is for Jesus. Then the, then the microphone was handed to little Jessica. She looked out at the audience. She froze. Slowly, her lower lip began to tremble. Her face crumpled. In a whisper, she said, I forgot. Then she began to cry. Sitting in the back row, Deb Meckler says she could hear soft, soothing sounds of sympathy and concern from the members of the congregation. Jessica's Sunday school teacher held out her arms, and Jessica hurried off the steps of the chancel and collapsed on her lap. Jessica's teacher assured her that it was okay. S then skipping over the letter L, the rest of the children picked the alphabet up with M and O and moved on. A short time later, Jessica's daddy appeared and lifted his little girl and lifted his little girl into his arms and carried her back to the pew where the rest of Jessica's family were seated. Meanwhile, the characters in the Christmas story continued to be uh, uh, spelled out letter by letter to the congregation. But those images were not nearly as poignant as the scene played out before everyone. The message, the message had been made flesh. The word, Jesus, was among the congregation. The love between the parents and children, the concerned sounds from the congregation, the warm hug of Jessica's Sunday school teacher, the arms of her daddy, these, my friends, are signs of the word dwelling among us. Jesus, this is Jesus in the flesh. Jesus wasn't kidding when he said, I will be with you always. He's among us when a little girl named Jessica freezes on stage. He is among us and, and even when Jessica can't remember what her letter of the alphabet stands for. Jesus is among us in a whole room full of people who love a little girl named Jessica all the more 
even when she cannot remember her lines. Theologians use the word incarnation to describe what we're talking about today. The Apostle Paul wrote about Jesus, not concerning equality with God as something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the nature of a servant, and being made in human likeness, humbled himself. And the life Jesus lived among us in this world was as challenging for him as it is for you and me. And what's left for us now is how we're going to respond to the Christ's presence. God is among us now, just as truly as when God appeared in the stable. God in Bethlehem. God is with us not only through the scriptures, but also in each other's faces and in arms that embrace us and in our presence with each other. Just like Jessica experienced at a Christmas program at her church, this is not just a sweet, romantic notion. Jesus said it would be like this when he sent us the Holy Spirit. The word was and is made flesh and dwells among us. Look around you, my friends. The spirit of the risen Christ lives among us. And like Sharon, who told the story of the birth of Jesus to John Shea with all the details as well as she could remember them, including peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, maybe, maybe like Sharon, maybe we should be whirling around and diving for cover in the midst of the glory of it all. Amen. Friends, when everything is said and done, the Apostle Paul tells us three things will remain. Faith, hope, and love. However, of these three, he assures us that the greatest is love. May the love of God that we have come to know in Jesus Christ our Savior, may that love go with you to bless you now and always. Amen. Thank you.